Yeah, yeah, I'm John Knight. Um, I work at Loughborough University, as the name may suggest, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our Loughborough Online Reading List System, or LAWS, as we call it. Um, I work in the IT services at Loughborough University now, um, but for the last 20 years or so, I've worked in the systems team in the university library. And Loughborough University Library is a bit weird in that our systems team wasn't formed of librarians who do a bit of computing, which is what a lot of library <coughs> systems teams are formed from. Our systems team is a bunch of hackers and coders who just happen to look after library systems at the same time. Which means that unlike a lot of people who buy a system in and they configure it and then they just use it and you know they load updates and, and tweak things here and there, we do that but we also make a lot of our own systems as well. So a lot of our stuff is open source. Um, Laws is one of our open source pieces of software. So first thing is, what's a reading list? Um, if you've not been involved with universities or academic libraries, you've probably come across them before. Basically, they're resource lists. Um, academics need to give their students some guidance when they're doing courses. They need to give them lists of books, journals, papers. It might be audio-visual material, the AD material you can see up there, so videos audio recordings, um, all sorts of things. Lots of different resources out there that the libraries can either provide or they can point people to. And the reading list system basically is just a way of managing that and providing it to the students in an easy way, allowing the academics to put them together in an easy way, and at the same time allowing the libraries and the librarians to get a view of what the academics are asking their students to look at, because that can be quite important. Um, the reading lists are basically generated during the summer, because that's when the academics are free for the most part, but they are updated throughout the year because academics will add new papers and journals and a new book has come out, so they're constantly updated, but the vast bulk of the updates come in the summer. Um, so our solution um, to this problem, originally the reading lists were all provided on bits of paper. You know, uh, academics would generate a Word document or before that, you can just type it out and distribute bits of paper to their students. Libraries would only find out what was on the reading list if a student came in and sat down in front of the librarian and said, do you have this book? My lecturer has told me I need to get it. And that might be the first time that the library has ever seen that that book needs to be given to students. Now, if they have got it in, that's great, but they might need more copies of it. Or well, they might have never seen the book before, I and mean, the academic has neglected to mention that they're giving this book to their students or recommending this book to their students. And then the library has a panic because they have to try and get an order for it. They have to work out how many students are on the course and what the appropriate number of books. Is it just a, a background reading book or is it a core text? And if it's a background book, you might buy one copy. If it's a core text, you might need 10 or 20 copies. Um, and so working out the books you might need to support undergraduate teaching was always a bit of a pain for academic librarians. It was a bit of a sort of dark science, a bit of magic going on. And um, back in, well, it was 1999 we actually really started. That was when the idea really kicked off, that we could come up with a system that would allow academics to provide these reading lists to the library, and the library would then provide it to the students, and at the same time the library would have an idea of what the academics were, were putting out to people. In 2000, in the fake millennium, we actually um, had our first system live. Um, that was the first time anyone really had got a web-based reading list system. Uh, we beat the commercial people probably by about six months to a year. Uh, there was a few people thinking about doing commercial systems, but we actually had them out there as a web-based system. Some people got them add-ons to library systems, but they were very basic, not a web-based single solution. Um, we carried on and we used that and developed it, um, and then we eventually decided to give it to some other people because other university libraries wanted to use it as well. So we thought, well, this sounds like an open source project, so we got the university to agree that we could put it under the GPL. They hadn't really heard of the GPL, and they just said, what does it mean? And we said, well, it means that we can give it to other people, but we're not responsible for the maintenance, so we don't have any costs associated with it. And they said, yeah, that's great, you can go and do that, that sounds great. Um, so put it out on the GPL, and that point we needed to have a name for it, so we sort of can't sort of cast around, and that's how we ended up with Laws, this funny name for the Loughborough Online Reading List system. Um, at the time, the first people that had it, I think, were Nottingham University, just up the road from us, and then it sort of spread out from there. We 
that's made it available, people can just pick it up and use it. We don't know how many people used it at any one time. I've still no idea how many people are using it now. I know that some people in America did, and, you know, some people in Europe, but it's like most things, when you put it out on, on um, SourceForge or GitHub or something like that, it just goes out there, and unless you're really desperate to keep track of it, you just assume people are using it. Um, we didn't really care because we needed it in Loughborough, and we were going to be developing it for Loughborough, and if other people used it, great. If other people, nobody else used it, it wouldn't make any difference to us. Um, we carried on using the first version for, you know, for six or seven years, and in 2007 we decided that we'd reached the end of the development um, process that we could do for the first uh, version. Um, we made certain assumptions as to how the reading of the system would work, which proved to be wrong or, or rather constricting. So we wrote it, rewrote it again, um, took advantage of more modern technology, went for a client server in, uh, interface, a lot more JavaScript, some APIs behind it so that other people can tie into it. Uh, we re released that, and again, there's been some more people using it since then. Um, nowadays, there's actually quite a lot of commercial options for people. Um, so there's people like Talus, List, and Rebus that also make very similar systems. They all do more or less the same thing. They're all resource lists that academics can fill in, that students can see, and then librarians can use to manage it. Um, there's all little tweaks. Every, every system has a thing it can do well, other things it can't do well. Um, the advantage we have is that we can do what we need to do well for Loughborough because we've got the code. We can fix it, we can tweak it, we can modify it. Oops. So, the technology is used. Um, underneath it all is a MySQL database. Uh, uh, the Postgres people are going to be throwing eggs at me at this point, but hey, that's what we knew, that's what we used, um, that's what the system was built <coughs> um, The back end of the system uses Perl CGI scripts to provide an API. Perl scripts aren't providing the user interfaces to the staff or the students, they're just providing the API interfaces. And the API is talking either uh, XML or JSON or JSONP uh, to the front ends. And the front ends are just running on the web browser and they're using JavaScript with the jQuery package. Uh, so the jQuery does all the nice front end. I will say, when you see it in a minute, I'll show it to you later on. The front end looks nice, it's nothing to do with me. If I did a web page, it looks like it's done from 1995. Luckily, one of my colleagues, uh, who is called Jason, um, is actually quite good at designing web pages. So he's done all the nice, fancy, glitzy user interface stuff. My stuff is the code at the back that's actually talking to the database and, and uh, doing the searching. The servers that we've used have always been Linux boxes, right from day one. Uh, we've been Linux. Um, for other things before 2000, so it was a no-brainer to just, you know, fire another Linux box to, to do tools with. Um, originally, uh, we had real iron, um, you know, real proper servers sitting there. Uh, they were running Red Hat Enterprise, because that was what we had for other library systems. These days, we've got VMs, like most people have in, in library organization, and they're running CentOS, um, which is effectively Red Hat Enterprise without actually paying the money for it. Um, and then the web server is, is built Apache. So this is your classic LAMP project. It, it's Linux using Apache, it's got MySQL and some Perl in there as well. So, um, at the bottom there, there's absolutely no Java, which is a bit of an in-joke for our guys, because we have to look up a thing called DSpace, which is written in Java, and is a nightmare. Um, none of us are really Java programmers, so I know that Chris, for example, is a, a keen on Java. We're, we're the exact opposite. We, we're keen on Perl and, and um, JavaScript, that sort of thing. So, we're Java free. <laughs> um, the benefits of the open source development for us, well, there's quite a few benefits to the university as a whole, really. It's flexible to develop for what we need, because we can put in exactly what the university wants. We don't have to buy a package and pick and choose the bits we want, maybe pay for stuff that we're not using, because it's all bundled together. And what we found with commercial systems is you usually pay a large quantity of money you get lots of features, but then you still have to do development work to tie them all together or to tie them into other systems that you've got. Um, a lot of my other work that isn't to do with laws is tying other systems together, providing the middleware uh, side of things. Um, the costs obviously are less than equal to commercial packages. Obviously, open source is free for us and for giving to other people. The cost is really the servers and people time. And those are going to be there whether or not we use the commercial package or, or 
not. Cloud means that the servers aren't necessarily there, but you're still paying up front for people to configure it and set the thing up. Um, and with reading lists, we find an awful lot of the person time isn't so much coding, it's advocacy, it's talking to users, it's persuading them that they need to put things into the reading list system. Because academics still would like to just basically give students bits of paper and, and hope they would go away. So persuading them that it's a much better idea to put them in a centralized system, everyone will get a better experience from it, uh, takes a bit of time and advocacy. And that doesn't matter whether you've got it open source or commercially. Um, and um, the other thing is, because I can bring this to things like Barcamp and tell people about it, so it's, it's really handy for them. Um, so this is what the students see, of course. There's a few screenshots. I'll show you some uh, the live one in a minute. Um, but basically, they can browse or search their reading lists, so they know what modules they're doing, so what bits of the course that they're on. Uh, they can look up via either the academic's name or the module code or the module title and find out what's on the reading list for, for that module. Um, we provide them with a standard citation format, which is a version of Harvard's citation format. Um, citation formats are interesting because academics often make a big thing about making sure that students have the right citation formats. And then when we get citations from academics, they are a mess. They are all over the place, you know. Um, I've been writing some code recently to suck in uh, paper reading lists or electronic reading lists and Word documents from academics, which is supposedly in the Harvard citation format. If I make a piece of code that can handle everything academics give to me, it will become self-aware, because they are just <laughs> all over the place. Um, but we can, at least we can give the students it in a standardized format, so that the, if they cut and paste, it looks right in their papers. Um, we can also show what holdings the library has. So the reading list system can contain resources irrespective of whether the library has a copy of them, because it might be electronic resources, it might be AV material that the department holds. If it's something that the library holds, we can display that holding information from our uh, library management system, which will tell you how many copies of the book we've got, are they out, are they on long loan or short loan, and all that sort of information. Um, we can also get book covers via Google Books. So that's quite useful for the undergrads, maybe especially for the first years who aren't really used to academic libraries. If you can show them a picture of what the book looks like, when they go down into the stacks to go and try and find it, at least they know what the cover is that they're looking for if they're not used to library uh, organisation. Um, and we allow the uh, students to like or dislike items. So they can go to a reading list and say, yeah, this book was really useful. Or alternatively, this book was a bit, mm, didn't really help me, didn't confuse me, it's very difficult to understand. That can help other students, but it can also help the academics, because if lots of the students on a reading list, and on a module say, well, this book that you said was a core text, none of us liked it. The academic can go to them, well, did you not like it because it's just hard and the subject's hard? Or did you not like it because it was hard but some other book made the subject easy? In which case, I should probably use another book because you know, this, this book isn't a clear resource for the, for the subject. So you can provide, basically, the students can provide feedback back to the academics. The academics themselves have a different view of laws. Uh, they can input items manually, so they can type stuff in themselves if they really want to. Um, they can also supply either the ISBN or the ISSN for the work. For a book, all books that are published have an ISBN, it's the thing that's written on the back of the book. If you look on journals, magazines, they have an ISSN, which is the same sort of thing, but for periodicals. Um, we can let them just put that number in, hit return, and we'll check in our systems and provide them with all the details already filled in, of author and title and all that sort of stuff. Um, they can hide items, they can edit them, copy them, and delete them. So they can put items in the reading list but not show them to the students. We found that's quite important because some academics want to show their lists a week at a time. So they don't want to show the students all the resources for a 10 week course. They want to show them the resources for week one in week one, the resources for week one and two in week two, and so on and so forth. So they extend the resources as they go through the course. And we let the academics pick and choose that. You can provide all of them, or you can provide just the ones for a particular time period. Um, the academics can also sort and annotate the reading list, so they can reorder the, the list, especially useful if they've imported lots of things in one go, and then they want to make some structure in it. So they say, oh, these books are more useful for the topics early in the course, these ones are better for later in the course, 
The annotations allow them to put notes against each item. So they might say, particularly read chapters two, three, and five, or I disagree with what Professor Blog says in this book, but you should read it anyway. Um, and some academics don't make any use of that at all. Some write war and peace, and it really does vary depending on the academic. Um, one thing we found actually is that with the different uh, faculties that we've got in the university, we have like the social science guys, we have the science guys, we have the engineers. Engineers, their reading lists are usually two or three books at most, maybe five if they're really pushing the boat out. Scientists, they use a bit more, they're, they're a few more books, so they might put 15, 20 books in their reading list. Social science people, well, the biggest reading list I think we've got is 1,572 <laughs> items. Um, uh, my boss, when he does a presentation, has a lovely graph on one of his where he shows you the, 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 a bar chart of how many books on each type of reading list. And you get down to social sciences and he attaches a bit of crepe paper to the end of the display screen and then walks over and <laughs> sort of like, you know, out the door somewhere. Um, basically, the, that's because the academics use things differently. The, the scientists and the engineers are giving books that are factual, students need to read them, if they don't read them, they'll fail the course, if they do read them, they'll have a better chance of passing. <laughs> Maybe, if they understand them, they'll have a really good chance of passing. Um, the social scientists and the English and drama folk, they're providing selections of books that they want the students to read around from, and they don't want them to all read the same books, because they want them to argue and debate and discuss. So their reading lists are much bigger, but they don't expect everybody to read all of it, especially to pick and choose. Um, that is something we've learned we, you know, since we've been doing this. We didn't know that beforehand. We just assumed that massive reading lists that social scientists were giving out were because the students were just sitting there reading constantly, and that's not the case. Um, and then we have a library view of laws. The library view is not so pretty, basically because I've had a hand in doing it. Uh, <laughs> but basically, these are the management reports. These are what the librarians are using um, to find out what resources we academics are asking students to look at. So this is the bit that allows the library to make sure that the right things are available in the right numbers. Um, so and the other thing is we allow academics to put private notes in, as well as the annotation the students can see. The academics can make, put private notes in that only the academics and the librarians can see. So the academic might say, um, here's this resource I want to pay for, um, and the private note is, please make it the third edition, I don't want the newer ones. Because there's something he wants in an older edition that he's teaching around, and newer editions have either changed it or removed it or done something to it. So that's sort of, again, a two-way street that the librarians can then put a note back in and say, well, I'm afraid the only one we can now get access to is edition blah. Um, the, the library staff for email with any changes that made to the reading lists. So when academics or library staff or library staff make additions or edit resources, the, there's a nightly cron job that goes through and checks to see what's in the change in the database, emails the librarian so they have a view of changes.